Hello, friends, and thanks for joining me on this episode 18 of the Unsunday Show. I really appreciate you being here with me. In this episode, I have a conversation with a longtime friend of mine, Bonnie Petroschuk. And we talked about everything ecclesia. We talked about ecclesia. We talked about church. We talked about leaders. We talked about pastors. And I think it was a really good conversation. Bonnie is on an incredible journey, starting to really see some things concerning the issues that we deal with here on the Unsunday show. And so I couldn't wait to get her on here and to let her talk to you and let you meet her, at least through the podcast, and hear a little bit about her story. And I think you'll be encouraged. I hope you're encouraged. So without any further delay, here it is. I have to say, I've really been looking forward to this, this conversation with you. I've I've been kind of watching things as they change with you online, you know, and it seems like you're on a different journey than you were and one that's pretty similar to mine. So I couldn't wait for this conversation. <laughs> yes. Um, I know God brought you to my mind right away the morning that I began this whole journey. It just popped into into focus for me. And immediately, for some reason, I thought, Mike, I have to talk to Mike. I'm pretty sure Mike <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. I'm glad you did. Yeah, so I've been really blessed by this, the things that you're that I'm seeing you say and do and the conversations that we've had online. You know, you and I have never met face to face, but we that's right. we've met on social media probably what, 4 or 5 years ago? Yeah, we we Something go way like back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we've we've enjoyed your blog and I'll ask you in a few minutes to give us that uh website for your blog and and other ways for people to contact you. But yeah, we've enjoyed your blog through the years. You know, back when I was at Chief Center on, on Twitter, you and I talked a lot. And so anyway, I just am excited to do this. I'm excited to have this conversation with you and, and kind of flush things out a little bit more as far as your own journey. So thank you for oh, this. I'm, I'm excited that I've been asked to do it, um, although I'm a little little nervous, but it's okay. That's <laughs> Well, we'll just kind of have a, a low-key conversation and, you know, see where this goes. I sent you those questions, and we'll use those as a, you know, just as a springboard for our discussion and kind of see where it goes from there. We might get on a few rabbit trails here and there, but that's to be expected. So I don't mind rabbit trails. <laughs> yeah. So, Bonnie, uh, pronounce your last name for me so I don't totally mess that up. My last name is pronounced Petroschuk. Although I have a caveat with that. It's Ukrainian. Obviously, it is my husband's last name. Um, but I don't believe, um, and I have it on good authority from several Ukrainians, that he pronounces it in anything, any way that's familiar to Ukrainians. So <laughs> I, I, it's probably closer to Petroschuk um, in the Ukraine. But okay. he said Petroschuk, and that's what I've gone with. So, well, that's what I we're going to go with today, then, Petroschuk. So. <laughs> yeah, I know I've butchered your last name in the past a few times, and I apologize for that. On our old Chief Center podcast, I know that I referenced you at least once, maybe more, as far as your blog, and I think I butchered your last name, so I'm sorry about that. I, but. I, have not, I haven't met a single person yet who hasn't butchered my, this last name, including my husband. So, <laughs> you know, you're, you're in good company. <laughs> okay. I feel better now. <laughs> well, why don't we uh, start off by, I'll just ask you to introduce yourself to us all and, you know, to kind of tell us a little bit of your, your background, your, your history, your story, your family, kind of just take that wherever you want to go. And let's, why don't we start there? You know, who is, who is Bonnie Petroschuk? Tell us, tell us that. Okay. Well, I am Mrs. Church and that's, it's a funny <laughs> way to start. That it was literally my nickname. I I have been in church since I was a uh, you know a few days old as my mother used to like to say. Um I grew up loving church. I married in the church. I had my children and raised them in the church. By the way, I have three wonderful adult children and, who have given me a grand total of six grandsons. Oh, congratulations. Um, thank you. I despair of ever having a girl, but you know, now I'm a I'm a a boy Grammy, so I'm, I'm I'm happy with that. I'm not even resigned to it anymore. I would have to say I'm happy being that. But church really 
is my life. I worked for a church, one of the first jobs that I had as an adult. I held every known position, I think, pretty much in a church, including lay pastor and chairman of a church board. I preached sermons. I led retreats and seminars. You know, I, and literally, I was lovingly and jokingly called Mrs. Church. Uh, So that has been my life. Uh, It really, really has. I was the nerd that enjoyed studying parachurch structures, (laughs) what was what were biblical structures and then what were structures that are kind of like the traditions of man, you know, added in and what I felt that we needed to retain and what was all right to let go. So I am the least likely person that you know to suddenly wake up one morning recently and be full of questions the idea of ecclesia, which I was familiar with the term, mm-hmm. kind of popped into my head. But I, the, all I knew of it was that it meant called out and how it was understood by the church to be that we were called out from the world. And that it was the supposed, in my mind, Greek translation from which we got our word church. So I don't have any reason my background or history to literally wake up one morning and decide to explore the concept of church and where it came from. But I did. And the first verse that I went to look up was, what did Jesus, what word did Jesus use um, when he said, thou art Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church. And I was, you know, assuming that church was, you know, going to be It was going to be pretty simple, and sure enough, it was Ecclesia. But somehow from that, looking up that word and then kind of starting to research it, I started on this whole unexpected, mind-blowing journey that I've been on ever since. And it was the reason that immediately I thought, Mike, (laughs) got to talk. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Yeah. I'm on another list. (laughs) I've apologized to you for dragging you into my journey, but oh no, I'm glad. (laughs) This has been a real blessing for me. If we could maybe circle back around, and if you don't mind me asking, your church experience was that in a particular denomination, or was it, you know, through the years, was it in several denominations? Can I ask that? Sure, Uh, it was in several denominations, but I was born into um, a fourth generation Seventh Day Adventist. Oh wow, Um, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Uh Uh-huh. And my parents were very involved in the church. And that was the church in which I I believe I may have been the very first female lay pastor in that denomination. But that actually ended up being shortly before I left that denomination. So um, no one may recall that or want to recall that. (laughs) (laughs) But it, it was at that point in time, and this uh, church wasn't the only thing that be- became. Sorry, that's my dog. That's okay. I love the, dogs. <laughs> um, he just just discovered the mailman. Uh, ch- church wasn't the only thing that defined me. What came to define me most of all, though, I discovered when I was still in the Seventh Day Adventist Church, and that was uh, grace, the gospel, and grace which I had no understanding of whatsoever. But a dear friend, a woman, a lay person, preached a sermon at that church. And I honestly don't remember the basics of it, but um, it was the gospel, pure and simple. And it was the first time I, if I had heard it before, it didn't register with me. So for me, that was the first time I had ever heard the gospel preached. And it absolutely blew me away, turned me upside down and inside out. Um, It scared me to death because I felt like it wasn't law abiding. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And, And it would lead me straight to hell, you know, if I believed it. But it sounded like the truth, and it just, you know, really, it just stabbed me in the heart. So I set about, because by, you know, at that point, I didn't 
figured there were any commentaries that I could trust. I didn't I didn't know who to trust, but what I had heard was different from what I had been taught my whole life. So I sat down with just the book of Romans and the Holy Spirit and dived into my own scripture study. And I wrestled and wrestled and wrestled my way through Romans, particularly Romans chapter six, and then finally came out on the other side of that study, absolutely 100% convinced of the gospel of you know, Christ alone, that it's not my merit, it's not anything of me except for that I bring my sin and that, you know, Christ credits all of his perfection to me and took upon himself all of my sin and died for it. And it's, you know, I contribute nothing but my sin. And I never looked back from that point on. I mean, that was like the turning point for me. How, How long ago was that? Oh, I was in my early 30s, and okay. I am 69 this year. <laughs> oh, happy pre-birthday. And, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. So, you know, that was a major turning point for me with church, obviously, as well. I, As I said, I ended up leaving the Adventist denomination. I was laboring under the ridiculous impression that the Adventists, the Seventh-day Adventists, were the only church that didn't know the gospel, mm. and that anywhere else I looked, I was going to immediately find it. And I assumed that that was also going to be the case on Christian radio. <laughs> and then, yeah, well, and this is the hilarious part. I assumed that if I just turned on Christian radio and listened to any program, I would hear the gospel. And the very first one that I turned on was Key Life okay. by Steve Brown, and, that, and I heard the gospel. And I was so excited, and shortly thereafter, he was taken off the air in my vicinity, mm-hmm. everywhere in my vicinity. Um, and quite honestly, Steve Brown and I <laughs> were church. My church, I attended other churches, but it was the my only source, my only outside source of the gospel for going on 30 years, maybe. Wow. Yeah, until the internet, seriously. And I, the only access I had because there was no, it, he wasn't on the radio anymore, and he wasn't, um, there was no internet, um, and I didn't get it until after it had been around for a while. So I received his monthly tapes and a newsletter, Mm -hmm. and that was my only outside input as far as gospel. Um, And other than that, it was, which was wonderful. And I don't, you know, I, it was the best thing in my life was just the Holy Spirit and scripture and me. And what kept me at it and centered was the fact that I ended up teaching senior high Sunday school for 20 years. And I didn't have any, I didn't use any outside studies. I was asked what I would like to use and I told them scripture. And it's a novel concept. (laughs) Well, it was was actually to them. Yeah. By then, by the way, I was in a Nazarene church. I don't ask you. Don't ask me how, but that's that's what happened. And I raised my children there after a brief stint in the Methodist Church between the Adventist Church and the Nazarene Church. So I didn't, after the initial pastor, which was the reason that I went to the Nazarene Church, who did know the gospel, he left very rapidly after I arrived. And after that, I, I didn't hear you know, much of the gospel being preached in that denomination, but I was teaching Sunday school. So I was preparing the lessons to teach. And I was, you know, preparing, of course, the very first book that I taught the kids was Romans and, you know, then Galatians and then Hebrews. And, you know, just all I did was books of the Bible, one at a time, teaching the gospel. And I'm sure I got way more out of it than than they did. And I did that for 20 years. And at that point, that was when um, the internet came along. And lo and behold, I discovered that Steve and I were not 
the only people in the entire world. That's right. That there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but up till then, I was pretty convinced that that was the case. So Yeah, you know, isn't that amazing? You talk about just relying on the Holy Spirit and just using Scripture alone. And, you know, you think about the early church, and especially here on the Unsunday podcast, where we talk about the early church a lot. But, mm -hmm. you know, you think about the illiteracy rate among the people then. And, you know, no, nobody had Bibles. Nobody had that stuff. But, you know, right. there, there were uh, letters being copied, hand copied and distributed, you know, as, as the, the New Testament writers wrote. But you just didn't have a lot of stuff. But you had Jesus and you had the Holy Spirit. And somehow, right. somehow that was enough. <laughs> you know, it, exactly. it, yeah, it, it just it, it's amazing to me to look back at that time. You know, I'm not saying that was some kind of golden era in church. I mean, they didn't have running water, so I don't, I don't want to go there. But, you know, at the same time, they it was such a uh, it was such a reliance upon the Holy Spirit and the relationship with the Holy Spirit through Jesus. And, right, and, and that's what Jesus said. You know, that's what he that was the what he promised. That's right. He shall be in you. He's been with you, but now he's going to be in you. Right. And you know, and he'll so, yeah, truth. You yeah, know, that's, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So that's good. Well, you know, we've already kind of touched on this some, but maybe we can dive a little bit deeper here. You know, and what are your thoughts? You know, how are your thoughts toward like institutional church changing? How have they changed? You know, what are you, what are you seeing different now? And what if hmm. what are some of the influences and experiences you know along the way that have caused you to change because. I'm I'm seeing something really exciting going on in your life, and you know I'd like to delve a little bit deeper into that if if you don't mind, and just ask you that you know how how are your thoughts toward institutional church, institutional Christianity changing? Well, you, keep in mind that this literally began about a month and a half ago, not even longer than that. So it's all new and i ha i don't have a whole lot of history to relate of how it has changed but it is changing my whole entire life and the way i look at everything i i guess i could talk a little bit about the progression it took for me okay and the what you know what absolutely was the turning point because okay. that didn't it began that day when i you know looked up started looking up the word ecclesia and contacted you and said do you know anything about Ecclesia? You can tell that I have not been keeping up with your podcast like I should have been. <laughs> so it was embarrassing in hindsight, but thankfully I did contact you. And I'm sorry that I, you know, embarrassed myself, but. <laughs> no, no, that was awesome. I mean, some of the texts that I received from you, you know, we were on a road trip and so I couldn't always get back to you right away. Mm -hmm. But man, some of the texts that you were sending, you know, we would read them. Susan and I would sit down and read them. And we'd go, wow, this is uh, this is quite a journey here. And, and the things that you were bringing up, you could tell that you were really researching things. So anyway, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So it was an exciting, it was, it was exciting for us to read those. I'm glad. Um, it was exciting for me. And it just seemed like it was, and it is very, it was very rapid. It, you know, it just happened very quickly because I was, I was researching and researching and researching and researching. Um, and what I was finding, I was, it was more and more disturbing, but it was also more and more exciting. But the, the real key pivotal point for me was finding out that, <laughs> that the word church is not in scripture. Right. That was, that was the most blind, uh, you know, blindsiding, mind blowing thing to discover that that is a man made term and that ecclesia simply meant congregation or gathering or assembly, uh, which, by the way, I also discovered that the word synagogue means almost exactly the same thing. And both of the terms refer to people. It did not originally refer to, you know, a building or a meeting place, although, you know, synagogue certainly came to mean that. But right. it its definition was primarily almost identical to the word ecclesia, which refers to a gathering of people. So 
you know, that was interesting. And then to discover that the what the actual origin of the word church was and that it's not in scripture, that it it a word that relates to it, and you may know more how to pronounce it, curiacon or something like yeah. that. Curiacon. Curiacon. Yeah, okay. Um yeah. what you said. <laughs> that that's where that word came from. It bears no connection whatsoever to the word ecclesia in the Greek. It comes from that word and is used in scripture twice. And right. it means the Lord's. And it refers once to the Lord's Supper and another time to the Lord's Day. That's um, right. That's exactly right. And it appears twice in Scripture. Right. But it doesn't appear at all in relation to the the word that is used every other time and translated church. It's never, ever, that word is never actually used and we translate it church because there's, church was just made up out of thin air. And that's been the hardest thing for me to wrap my brain around because Mrs. Church, right? You right, know, so right, right. and and everything about what I believe about or have believed about Christ is this is his church and his body and you know, it's just meant everything. And to find out that that was never the plan, that was never the intention, that was never the concept. So, of course, then I had to go on and find out where it did come from and, you know, how it came into use, which was really hard to uncover. And I guess, you know, part of the reason is because we all bought the whole thing about church. So nobody's yeah, it really... Takes some, it takes some intentional research, doesn't it? It does. So why don't, why don't you still... tell us? Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? About what you discovered? Okay. Well, I don't think I've really totally even been able to nail it down yet. But basically, Christianity, which by the word why that word itself, Christianity, I now realize arose from the whole concept of church, and it's also mind-boggling and troubling to me. But anyway, <laughs> Christianity was. Uh, a religion. It was one of the religions, and it had, you know, other w titles like the way, you know, or mm -hmm. whatever. But it was a religion, and we and nobody was calling it church. Everyone was calling it ecclesia until, and as close as I can narrow it down, um, somewhere in the fourth century, and it had to do with probably around the time that Constantine married the Christian religion with the Roman government, as far as I can tell, that may have been when people actually started using that word. But the confusion is that nobody seems to be real clear on that. And the only time that they really nail it down is when the after the Reformation. So in the 1500s and 1600s, um, you find that word beginning to be used. But the horrifying thing for me was that I discovered that Tyndall, who mm, refused, yes. he specifically refused to use the word church in his translation. He used congregation or assembly, um, but primarily congregation, translated every time ecclesia um, was used. And then he was persecuted for that. Oh, yeah. And, uh, it, it ultimately led to his demise. That was like, oh my goodness, you know, he was a martyr for using, refusing to use the word church. And that the word church then really finally became prominent um, in the King James Version. Uh, and that was as a result of the king wanting to retain ownership and rulership over the church's properties. And so, and, and this was, you know, like the Anglican church, um, born of Henry VIII and his mm -hmm. discre discretions, so indiscretions. So that was, King James issued 15 edicts, and one of them was that the word ecclesia must be translated church in the entire translation of the King James. It wasn't until, you know, that edict was issued that then the King James Version, which of course is held with great reverence today by so many, 
where the word church was consistently translated, even in awkward places like the Old Testament, um, where there was no church yet. Right, you know? right, exactly. It wasn't a pro- prophetic, you know, scripture, but you know, because of his edict, they had to translate it that way. So we have the awkwardness of King David apparently belonging to a local church. I don't know. <laughs> it's you know a little yeah. strange. So. That's some really good research that you did. You know, I appreciate that. I, I know that at least by, from what I've discovered, is that at least by, you know, 500 AD or so, that Kuriakin was, you know, used pretty commonly to refer to the ecclesia instead of, uh, you know, and used in place of the church. And and when I'm you, glad you nailed that down. I, I, <laughs> I'd love to say yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you get to... The old English word for church it, it it means a lord's possession or a lord's house, and I th- right. I think originally it talked about it might have been referencing a an English lord. You know, I I don't know that part for sure, but as far as you know, the meaning of it originally was a lord's house or a lord's possession. And you're exactly right. When you get into a situation with top down authority, and those in authority want to keep their authority then mm-hmm. they're going to do what they need to do to keep church church and to keep you know the whole thing going the way it is and you know to William, keep control yeah to keep control of people and and William Tyndale you know the, being the rebel that he was he was going to translate that first english bible by using the word assembly or congregation like you said and it ended up you know they strangled him and then they burned him Right, and you know, he he got both the king and the pope ticked off because he wouldn't say he wouldn't use church. And, right, you know, and, and, isn't that yeah, yeah? Hmm. It's it's amazing. It's amazing to read. It's sad for me, but it's really yeah. um, you know it's amazing to see how that those in authority will do pretty much anything, including murder people, to keep authority in, in that at that time. And yes, that's scary. That's really scary. Yeah, me too. To me too. Yeah, so your research there about William Tyndale, I really appreciate you mentioning him and uh, the whole idea of the word church not being in in scripture, but it is, you know, it is ecclesia and and it, that's a different thing like you said. That's that's not bricks and mortar. It's not wood and, and drywall and you know, whatever. Right. It's exactly. it's hearts. It's people's hearts. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's so. people. And that's um you know, naturally, once I, my head, the top of my head blew off when I found all of this out. <laughs> I've been using that emoji a lot with the, you know, the mind. Yes, um, yes. That's, that's where I've been. But then, of course, I was like, just, I wanted so much to know what the original picture was, you know, and then it, you know, so I've been studying Ecclesia and you know what that was supposed to look like, and of course, all of the verses about where two or three are gathered, mm-hmm. you know, suddenly begin to come back into my head, and and what that actually meant, you know, it's not, it wasn't this whole thing about how on a particular day of the week you all go together to you know listen to someone give you a sermon after you've sat there through a whole bunch of other stuff. And then you all go home. It, there was none of that. No, none of that is not at all. there at all. And it's, you know, church is when I meet one of my friends in a restaurant and we talk about, you know, what's going on in our lives and, um, you know, and ask each other to pray for each other's needs. And, you know, it, it just takes two, two to be church, you know, two or more, of course. Right. Um, but then it's because the word itself means gathering or assembly, you know, you you have to assume that you'd be hard pressed to make it mean just me. <laughs> right, right, exactly. There's no solo church. Right. Solo um, ecclesia. So, See, I, I still say church. <laughs> there's no too. solo there's no solo ecclesia. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Unless you're schizophrenic, I guess that's maybe right. you can that's right. Yeah. So that's what I've I've really been it's changed everything for me. You know, you, you've asked, what did it change? But it's changed everything. It's made me realize that, you know, throughout the entire history of Scripture, 
mankind was always trying to build God a building. Mm. And God was never about, you know, building a building. He said, he promised, you know, in scripture that he was going to build something for himself. And, and what it was, was Christ, you know, Christ was what he built. And then in Christ, we are the temple, it says, you know, we're the temple the Holy Spirit. So it's never been about this big place where we all meet and gather. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You know, he's in us. So whenever we're together, we are, we, I almost said we are the church. We, (laughs) we are the ecclesia, you know, we, uh, he's present with us, among us, you know, that's, it's wherever we are. That's right. Just like wherever the sanctuary was in, with the Israelites way back, you know, in the their wandering days, wherever that was, you know, that's where God was. Well, now it's it's He's in us, that's and right. wherever we, that's where He is, and that's just and, so incredible. And the ecclesia is everywhere. It's in every setting. There's there's you know there's believers scattered all over the place. You know, yes. they're they're in the institutional setting, and then they're outside of the institutional setting. The thing that that I see a lot is that those within the institutional setting, many of those within the institutional setting, and the institutional setting itself thinks it's the only valid expression of the ecclesia, yes. and I think it's the least valid. You know, my personal I... opinion, but you know, Jesus mm-hmm. said he's going to build his ecclesia. If we want to translate that church then let's, you know, let's say that the church Jesus is building looks a lot different than the churches we build. For sure. You know? Yes, absolutely. Because, absolutely. yeah, you know, the institutional church, the institutional church brings Moses to church, in my opinion. You know, they, yes. they, they, they don't understand. It. Yeah, they don't understand the separation between Old Covenant and New Covenant. And so they're mixing the two together. And the, they're bringing the old, yeah, they're bringing Old Covenant law you know the old the old covenant. Jesus said, "If you believe Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about me." That tells me right. that Moses isn't about Moses. Moses is about right. Jesus and the things that were pictured in the sacrifices. Like you know, you mentioned the temple; these were all physical pictures of spiritual realities that didn't come to fruition until you know the cross and the the, right. the beginning of the ecclesia in Acts two. And but boy, we get muddled in that, don't we? And in the, oh, in the church, totally. you know, in the church, we, we have, we have sanctuaries, we have temples, you know, we have altars in the old covenant. The altar was used for animal sacrifices. So if we're going to have an <laughs> altar, maybe we should institute animal <laughs> sacrifices, you know, but these, these were all a picture. These all pointed yeah. to a greater than Moses. These all pointed to one who was coming after Moses, you know, and, and, but man, you know, church gets that all mumbled up and it gets confusing and people get hurt and yes people people get uh discouraged and they 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 feel judged and they get a wrong view of god and a wrong view of grace and the gospel and they they just they get all mixed up and that hurts that really hurts it does and and you're absolutely it's like it's it's the power uh corrupts thing and that's you know it's when I think back to when Israel wanted a king, and it, just like they wanted a temple, yes, um, it's all part of the same thing, you know. That it's our search for power, just like Israel was searching for earthly power by having a king instead of you know just having God and trusting that you know God was going to be with them. Just like now, instead of trusting that God is in each one of us and that when we get together you know he's with us because he's in us and instead of that we have to we've made the pastor the king that's right king pastor (laughs) yes yes you know it's just been every aspect of it is just so mind-boggling to me that i you know it's it's changing the way i look at everything but i appreciated what you what you said because i have concluded you know, that God's never surprised and we don't really thwart his plans, you know, and God certainly knew and was aware that Ecclesia was going to be hijacked almost right out of the gate. 
um, and become what it became. And perhaps, you know, the unholy alliance of, of church and state that developed um, was the only way to preserve a lot of what was true, you know, so that it wouldn't just disappear into the, you know, a way out of mm. history and, you know, into the woodwork somewhere, um, you know, that it actually has served its purpose and is serving a purpose. And I, I, I don't want to say, and I don't want to sound like I'm saying that every church out there is just, you know, wrong and of the devil, you know, using right, the- right. Because I do believe that there are, you know, many beautiful fellowships that are churches that are ecclesias, you know, and I, I think yes. I said this to you guys in a rather garbled text, <laughs> but it just <laughs> struck me. That not, you know, there's nothing wrong with all churches. There are true ecclesias that meet in church buildings and have a pastor and and but there are also true ecclesias that never enter a church building. Um, and it's not that they're house churches either, you know, it's right. that they've had the entire concept of church and they're true ecclesias, you know, and they never they don't have any association with what we think of as church um, that are, you know, are also biblical. So I do have to say, though, that I don't believe that any one denomination is the ecclesia. <laughs> you know? Exactly. That's I, right. That's right. You know, so. Yeah. You know, I think that I th- getting back to, you know, an earlier statement that you made about how we like to work and we like to do things, you know, and, and Israel wanted a king and Israel wanted to build a temple. You know, David wanted to build a temple. And you think about that, you know, even in the New Testament, even the, in the Gospels, you know, when Jesus was being transfigured, you know, on that mountain, and he was up there with three yeah. of his disciples. You know, even their response was, "Hey, Lord, this is cool. Let's let's build tents. Exactly. <laughs> let's, yeah. uh, let's pitch three tents here. You know, and in the midst of all that, that was their response. You know, Let, let's let's build something to to honor this instead of you know realizing what was actually going on. And hey, let me ask you a question: Have you read mm-hmm. the book Clash of the Covenants? No. Oh, Bonnie, you got to get that book. Clash okay. of the Covenants. It's by uh, Mike Kapler with a K, Kapler with a K. It's on Amazon. And okay. I love that book. That it talks about Old Covenant, New Covenant. And it's, it's, in my opinion, my humble opinion, it's the best book out there on that subject. And it's, a, awesome. it's an awesome read. You know, it isn't, it isn't super technical and isn't going to lose you, but it, it really gets into everything that, that they... You know, understanding the difference between old covenant and new covenant, and everything that that touches, in 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 church and the ecclesia, and and man, it huh. is really good. I think I think it'll be a real blessing to you. And it's again, it's Clash of the Covenants by Mike Kapler, and I interviewed him a couple of times on our Grace Cafe podcast, and one of those interviews was with Joel Brzezinski, who is his partner in gospel crime over there, where. They have a podcast together called Growing in Grace. I don't know if you're familiar with the Growing in Grace podcast either. you know. But here I am promoting other podcasts. But hey, this isn't about me and my resume. This is about Jesus and his resume. So you know, if you head on over to Growing in Grace and listen to the Growing in Grace podcast, it is excellent. They've been doing that for 11 or 12 years now. And they are gospel-centered, gospel-focused. Each one of their episodes is 14 minutes long. And Perfect. They, t- they talk about... <laughs> They talk, they talk about necessary stuff, and it's all centered around the gospel. It's all centered around grace. It's all centered around, you know, the old covenant and the new covenant, and how that the new covenant replaced the old. The old is obsolete, and they really do a good job in uh, fleshing out, um, you know, what that means today, and and how that should look today in our in our church. And anyway, I just wanted well, to see. mention that to you, and you know, recommend that to you. I think you'd really be blessed by it. Uh, It sounds like it, definitely. You know, we see things like, you know, the word pastor appears one time in the New Testament, doesn't it? Ephesians 4. (laughs) And we've so institutionalized it. And, you know, I've said before on this, on my podcast here, on the Unsunday show, 
that I'm not, I'm not, when I talk about things like this, I'm not talking about the people that are in it. I'm talking about the system. Yes. And that's, absolutely. That, you know, as a former pastor, you know, that wore me out. It caused me to crash and burn that I it was, everything's so pastor centered, you know, and, and it's just not fair. It's not fair to the people who are the pastors and it's not fair to the, to the ecclesia as a whole, because the ecclesia, when we look in the New Testament, it's every member functioning. It isn't a small group of people functioning or one person functioning. And like you mentioned earlier, it isn't about, you know, listening to a weekly lecture and it's participation. It isn't, it isn't passivity. It's, it's every member contributing. And that's, and isn't that foreign? <laughs> isn't that what? I'm sorry. Foreign. Oh yeah. The whole, yeah. Yeah. The whole thing. None of us are used to that. Uh, the idea of each one of us bringing something, even though that's what scripture says. <laughs> we don't, that's unheard of. You know, and I think it's unheard of. I think you're, you're exactly right. And I think it's unheard of because I think church has successfully trained the ecclesia out of us. Oh, yes. You know, we don't know how to do that anymore. If um, I've, I've challenged some people before, you know, especially people that are pastors in these churches. I said, you know, <laughs> what if you just didn't show up unannounced? You know, you've got people in your church that just decide, well, I'm not going to go this Sunday, or they get sick or last minute or something, and they, whatever. For whatever reason, they just, they're not there. I said, what happens if, if you're just not there and nobody knew ahead of time? You know, and, and think about that. I mean, the whole thing would come to a grinding halt. <laughs> Everybody would go home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because church has trained the ecclesia out of us, and we don't know how to be part of that ecclesia and part of that every member functioning. And, you know, but it's true. It, right. We've so elevated that, that one person, that one pastor, and made that pastor, he or she is now the CEO and in charge, yes. and it's a career path, and, you know, we're hiring and firing, and it just, uh, you know, all of that is a, is a product, I believe, of church history and of tradition. So, anyway, I got mm -hmm. off on a rabbit trail there. <laughs> I liked the rabbit trail. Okay. I mean, it's, it's still all part of that. The whole gifts idea is biblical, you know, it's there. Um, and I remember on uh, one of your podcasts in on Sunday where you talked about, you know, we don't call each other Giver Joe or right. Hospitality right. Hannah, or, but it's the same <laughs> exact thing. It's not like, you know, they're, they're different somehow. There is no hierarchy that is, you know, pastor. And all of that comes from um, the the whole idea of church it does, and all of that came from the whole pagan idea of religion. There were altars, there were you know this, that, and the other thing, you know, and buildings and whatever. Um, and we even it got incorporated around the time of Constantine into what you know became known as church, and it stayed that way, and it's grown and it's gotten you know monstrous. That's right. Which is why I, you know, I really am trying to train my brain not to say church because it's not that, you know, the word itself is just so bad or horrible, but it's everything that it has represented and the blindness that it has created. Mm -hmm. You know, it just has blinded us to what scripture actually says that That's we're right. supposed to be and, you know, uh, and kept us from looking at the gifts, for example, you know, it's, uh, I can't tell you how many church services I've sat through where there's been a sermon preached on gifts and it's all about serving the institution. That's right. Exactly. Every, right. every bit of it, you know, oh, yeah. What if, what if, what if you have a speaking gift, but you're not allowed to get up front and say anything, or if you have a question, you know, if, a, if you're listening to a Sunday lecture and a pastor says something that you don't agree with, you can't raise your hand and say, can you explain that a little bit more? <laughs> you know, I mean, you could do that, I guess, once, <laughs> but, yeah, but you'll be marked as, out. Yeah. As the deacons arrive at your row. That's to right. You out. <laughs> That's right. But, you know, amazing thing to me is in Acts chapter two and the Holy Spirit came is no one was looking for a pastor. Right. You know, and, and the early ecclesia, no one was looking for a pastor. Pastors were, were there, you know, they were, they were elders. I think elder pastors, same thing. They were a part of the assembly, but they weren't the head of the assembly. 
Jesus was. And, and it was every member functioning and, you know, but we don't question today why things are the way they are. If we do, we get in trouble. Yes. You know, I I got a letter, I got a letter this morning, you know, an electronic letter, not a paper letter, but I got a, a letter this morning from someone who started to question things about grace and the gospel in a, in a particular denomination, a particular church. And this person was told, you know, straight out, you have to stop doing this or leave. So she left. Wow. You know, and we get on the Grace Cafe podcast, we get stories like this all the time from, you know, this kind of stuff happening. It seems that the most, gosh, what's the word I'm looking for? (laughs) The most hostility, maybe not hostility, but the most yeah, resistance. Yeah, the most resistance to the grace and to the gospel comes from other believers, not unbelievers. That's right. Which just blows my mind. You yeah. Know, you can't, me too. Yeah, you you've got too much Jesus over there. <laughs> like how can I have too much Jesus? Come on. <laughs> anyway, well, Bonnie, I better let you go. You know, I could do this all day long. It's good to finally be able to talk to you and you know, do yes. something other than email or text or whatever and to actually have some time to flesh this out. I really appreciate you coming on with me today and, and sharing your story and your experiences and, you know, just talking this well, stuff I, through. I appreciate the the opportunity to, you know, share what's absolutely blowing me away. At this point. <laughs> Maybe we can do it again sometime in the future as your journey unfolds more and you discover new things that you want to share or talk about. So just let me know if that happens. And Thank you, Mike. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate you. You too. <laughs> You've been very instrumental in my in all of my history since we've gotten to know each other. So I, I truly appreciate both you and Susan. Oh, thank you very much, Bonnie. We'll do it again, okay? Okay. You have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, that's about it for this episode 18 of the Unsunday Show. I'm really glad you're joining me again on this episode, and I hope that you are encouraged by it and by Bonnie's story, and hopefully I'll have her back on the podcast at some point, and we can talk a little bit more and get a little bit more detail about her story as it progresses, and I think that that would be a real encouragement for all of us. So anyway, until next time, y'all take care. (laughs) 